In this video, we're going to look at some common JUnit annotations and asserts. I'm going to show some examples. I'm going to use Eclipse just because that's kind of an IDE that a lot of people know, but nonetheless, these examples will apply equally in Eclipse or in an Android Studio project. We can reuse a lot of this stuff. Uh, NetBeans, IntelliJ. So don't worry so much about the IDE. Uh, the real focus here is on the annotations and asserts. So first of all, JUnit. We know from our history of testing that JUnit is a tool that we can use to help us to write and execute some unit tests. So JUnit version 4 is what we're going to be working with here. And that comes with a few annotations that are new compared to JUnit 3, or essentially ways of doing things we used to do in JUnit 3. Uh, example, in JUnit 3, we had a setup method and a teardown method. These methods would run before and after a test. Uh, now in JUnit 4, we do them with annotations. So at before class means run, we, we, sorry, we put that over a method. That means run this one time before any of the tests are run. At before, if we put that above a method, that means run this method before each test is run. So every time we run a test, we do the at before, but we do the at before class only once. The at before class is typically static, a uh, static method, where the at before is typically a non-static method. Now, as you might guess, at before class, at before, they have counterparts. At after class and at after, you can probably guess what they do. At after class is run, run once after all tests have been run, and at, at after is run after every single test. Now, one of the most important annotations we're going to have is the at test annotation. The at test annotation means this is a method that should be run as part of a unit test. So once again, these are all method level annotations that we're looking at here. And it just says, hey, JUnit, this is a really important method to run. We have a couple of attributes that we can give to the at test annotation. If we anticipate that a test will return an exception, then we can have an expected attribute and then the equal sign after the equal sign will have the exception that we're expecting to receive. So in other words, the test is successful if we receive this exception. That's a really handy way to test things that are not on the happy path. We also have a timeout. Uh, we have to think about duration here. Maybe the test gave us the right result, but maybe it took 48 hours. That probably is not going to make any service level agreements that we have. So we have a timeout in milliseconds where we can say this test is successful only if it passes and within this given number of milliseconds. And then finally, we have add ignore. Add ignore can be used to say we temporarily want to not run this test. So let's start by experimenting with some of these annotations. Again, Eclipse IDE, just any old project. Uh, many Java projects will have the source test Java folder. So if you happen to have that, that's a great place to start. I'm going to go to the package that I have here, which is Complant Places, and I'm simply going to say new class. That's one nice thing about JUnit 4 is a test class is just a plain old Java class. It doesn't have to extend anything, doesn't have to do anything special. So we will call this one JUnit annotation examples, something like that. And then we'll choose finish. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is just make sure that we have what we need to have. So I'm going to make a method called public void run tests, uh, kind of a very generic method, but nonetheless. And now let's give it the at test annotation and save. Notice it doesn't recognize the at test annotation, so I'm going to go ahead and import this. Okay, within my run test now, I'm going to say int i equals one plus one. And then I'm going to jump ahead a little bit and say assert equals uh, two comma i. Uh, this is something that we're going to see on our next slide, but nonetheless, this is how we essentially validate our tests. I'm just saying that i should be the same as two. And once again, this is going to require a static import. So I simply click on that and give it a static import. Set a breakpoint here and save. And now we see that it compiles. Now in Eclipse, as with most development environments, I can right click and notice when I choose debug as, I have the option to debug this as a JUnit test. Other IDEs might show this slightly differently, but at least for Eclipse, uh, it's, it's all gonna be something very similar to this. So when we debug, we can debug it and just as we're debugging a normal program. So right click and debug unit test 
and we'll go ahead and switch to the debug perspective. You see now that the debug breakpoint that I had is lit up in this mint green color, meaning that it is waiting for my input. So in Eclipse, I'm going to take, take a look at the uh, step into and step over keys. F6 to step over, that's what I need, and F8 to resume. A warning here, IDEs are never the same on debug keys. So uh, as memory serves for NetBeans and IntelliJ, uh, F8 is the step over key. Uh, for uh, Visual Studio, it's uh, F10, I believe, going from memory. But nonetheless, we go ahead and we choose F6, and we see in I equals 1 plus 1. That runs as it normally would run. Now I can choose F8 to tell it to finish running this test, and the test is essentially complete. I'm going to jump out of debug, and I'm going to jump back to Java EE view and take a look. We get a green bar, and the green bar indicates that our test has run successfully, because we know that 2 equals 2. Uh, just to confirm that it would it would not give us a green bar if this assert did not work, I'm going to right click. I'm going to change the test to 3 and have 3 equal to i. i is going to be 2. That won't work. Uh, it will fail. So this time I don't need to debug. I'm just going to run it as a JUnit test. And you see this time we've got a red bar. And the red bar tells us expected 3 but was 2. So it tells us exactly why the test failed, and then it tells us, uh, if we click on this line, exactly which test failed. Because we can, and many times we want, to have many of these assert statements, so this will tell us precisely why it failed. Okay, speaking of which, let's go ahead and add a few more tests, just because I want to show the before and the after syntax that we talked about earlier. So I'm going to, uh, first of all, bump this up a little bit, and we'll say run test and run more tests. And this time we're going to say assert equals. We'll make one of them correct and one incorrect. Okay, now let's use the other annotations we talked about. So uh, we'll say public, static, void, uh, set up everything, and open curly, close curly. And we're going to call this one at before class. Now I just want to quickly demonstrate how each of these are used. So I'm, I'm just going to set a quick breakpoint here without actually doing any initialization. We'll say int i equals 1 plus 1 again. Of course these are different i's because they have different scope, but this at least gives me a point where I can add a breakpoint. Now we know the rule. We know that we don't want to uh, move on before we've solved our red lines. And if we take a look at before class, guess what? This one needs to be imported as well. Now by the way, when I'm doing these imports, I'm assuming that you have, uh, you know, that the JUnit is part of your class path, whether you've added it to a POM or not. But it is becoming more ubiquitous. We're sending, we're seeing a whole lot more of it. So uh, not a hard thing to do. Okay, let's do an at before. Now remember an at before is going to run after each test method, where at before class only runs one time before all tests. Uh, and again, with the debugger, we'll be able to demonstrate this. So at before, public, static, uh, sorry, we don't want that to be static. Public void, set up before each test, and the name I'm giving the method is irrelevant. It's the annotation that's the most important. You probably know where we're going here. We're going to say import before. So an import before, uh, once again, we'll just do a dummy line, and we'll add a breakpoint to that dummy line. So there we go. There's our dummy line and our breakpoint. Hopefully it all captured there. Just make sure multiple markers, and one thing I don't like about Eclipse is uh, how the markers kind of overlap each other. I wish there were a better way that would happen. Okay, now the afters, uh, just to, uh, again, do things quickly here. I'm going to, uh, we'll go ahead and put the afters at the bottom. And I'm simply going to change the annotations to uh, after class and at after. And of course, we'll want to import these. So import after class. Uh, normally, just Control Shift O will handle the imports. I'm using a virtual machine through a browser, and so the browser many times uh, is is intercepting my shortcuts. So that's why I'm doing them the long way. We'll call this one tear down everything. You don't have to use that word tear down, but setup and tear down those are the traditional words that we use in the language of uh, JUnit to say. Uh, set something up, tear it down. I guess that goes without saying, but nonetheless, it does kind of have a special meaning, but it's more historical than anything. Set a couple of breakpoints here, and I'm going to run this in the debugger, and it is going to uh, probably be quite a bit of debugging just because of the number of breakpoints I've set up. So I save, and now I'm going to right click. And what I really like about the debugger is it does let us see this order of operations. So debug as JUnit test. 
Now, count with me uh, as each of these run. Note the before class. This is getting called the very first time. So we see the before class, and I choose F8, which means go ahead and continue to the next. Now, note the at before. This is getting called once. So at this time, we have one for the at before class and one for the at before. Okay, uh, now here's our first test, and it's running, and we know that one's going to fail. After that test runs, we do the, the at after. Not the at after class, but just the at after. Now we're running another test. Notice at before is running for a second time. It's running for a second time because guess what? We're running our second test. We walk through our second test, and then what runs again? The after, and again, after runs a second time. Now we only have two tests, so what's going to run after the at after annotation? The at after class annotation is going to run and then we're done. In case you missed any of that, here is the sequence that we went through. The at before class, the at before, these were both triggered by test number one, then the at after. Then test number two came next, so we did the at before, test number two, the at after, and then we wrapped it up with the at after class. So those are the annotations that we use to describe our methods. We'll also see several asserts that we can use. We already looked at one called assert equals. Uh, just to cover the first one quickly, assert array equals is looking at two binary arrays. This is one I haven't used a whole lot, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Assert equals and assert not equals, these are used to cover things like primitives and strings. And the assert equals is just saying, did I get a respected result back, an expected result? So I'm expecting to, did I get two back? What's important to show here is that these methods are overloaded by many different types. Here's the official documentation from JUnit, and you see assert equals. We have double, we have long, uh, we have objects, so we can assert objects. Uh, we have uh, double again, yeah, we have strings. So there's not just one assert equals method. There's essentially one for each of the primitive types plus string plus object. Now you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't assert that a double is equal to an int. That wouldn't make much sense. One other thing I want to point out here is notice some of these are deprecated. And the reason is, take a look at this one right here. Assert equals, double expected, double actual, double delta. And we have the same thing for float. Uh, so why is that? Reason is that double and float data types have floating point arithmetic, uh, which to describe it very quickly, uh, how do you save one divided by three in a finite length of memory? We know that one third is 0.33 continuous, but we can't represent continuous and finite memory. So a little bit of inaccuracy gets introduced as we do mathematical operations on these. And so one as a double might not be 1.000, it might be 1.00345 or something like that. There's a bit of floating point inaccuracy that's introduced, and that's where this double delta comes in handy when we're dealing with a floating point number. So several of these methods here, you see assert equals, and obviously assert not equals is saying we don't want these two things to equal. Assert false and assert true, uh, that's just a method that either accepts a Boolean or accepts an expression that evaluates to a Boolean where a Boolean is true or false. Assert null, again, this kind of goes without saying, uh, assert null is used to make sure that an object is null. And assert same, okay, make sure these two objects are the same. Assert that, that's a bit more complicated. It uses a matcher. Uh, that's if you're getting down and dirty. I've used those with Hamcrest before, but nonetheless, uh, assert that is when you kind of have a really complex case that you want to assert, or even an easy one, but you want to use this helper class called a matcher to help you with that uh, assert. And then fail means we shouldn't have gotten here. Uh, that's something a lot of times I might catch an exception and then issue a fail. But then again, we can actually handle exceptions through something we saw earlier, which is this uh, expected uh, parameter here. So a lot of times I'll use that if I'm in a point of code where I don't expect to be. Nonetheless, let's take a look at these. We've already seen the assert equals and we saw how it uh, does not work. So let's do, well, I'll tell you what, let's do this. Let's make, uh, let's make this instead of int i, let's make it double i. Probably should be a different letter then. Uh, 1.0 plus 1.0. Now take a look, you see it gives me a little strike through on the assert equals because it knows if we are asserting equals on double, we shouldn't just use an expected, which comes first, and then an actual, which comes next. 
but we also need to introduce a delta. Just for fun, let's make the delta right now zero, which means these two things have to uh, both, both come out to be the same. Um, I'll add a few more tests here. I'll add them to the run more test. Uh, we have, we know we have a certain all. So we'll, let's say I do uh, string s comma assert null s. And if we want to make it official, we can say a string s equals null, or we could even say object o equals null, something like that. This is an assert I have not used before, so I'll go ahead and add a static import for it. Uh, yeah, let's make it easier. Let's make it object o. Object o equals null assert. Uh, null o. Okay, and then we saw assert true. Assert true, you can use it for a boolean, but it's also kind of good for a catch-all as well. If you just want to say, I want to make sure that this came out to be what I thought it would be. So assert true, uh, 4 equals 2 plus 2. So you see, I just kind of put an expression in line there. Um, uh, actually, should be 4 equal equal. Uh, that being a comparison operator. And here we'll go ahead and say, okay, uh, add static import. So see I'm doing these kind of a little quick and dirty, but nonetheless, you get the idea. Uh, I'll go ahead and do one more. We'll do a run failed test so that we can use that fail. run fail tests, and we'll just say fail. Fail doesn't take an argument. It just means we shouldn't get here. As a matter of fact, what might be fun is just to take off the test annotation uh, because we know that we shouldn't get there if we don't have the test annotation. So why don't we go ahead and do that? Uh, I'll save, and we will run this test as it is right now. Again, uh, a lot of these methods are overloaded, so you can certainly play around and get some different results. We've already debugged, so I'll just go ahead and run it as a normal unit test. Now take a look at the unit test and you see that the unit test passed. Let's expand here and we went to run tests. So this is our method. It looks simple enough where it was able to assert that these are equal with a zero delta and then run more tests and it was able to execute each of these asserts successfully. Note that it did not fail because we don't have the at test annotation above our run fail test. So just for S and G's, I'll go ahead and add it. And then we'll run one more time as JUnit test. Okay, this time one of our tests failed and it was our run fail test. We click on it and it shows us exactly where it failed. And we have an assertion error here that tells us that it failed. Now remember, we also have that add ignore annotation. So we can say, okay, add ignore, uh, and we'll need to import this. Okay, import ignore. Let's try just one more time. Actually, I'll tell you, we'll try just a couple more times. So run as unit test. And now we see that the test does indeed pass, even though we're forcing it to fail, because we've added this add ignore annotation, which means, okay, this is something I'm working on right now. Maybe I don't want to be distracted by it. For the moment, I'm just going to ignore it. Okay, let's try one more. Let's go ahead and do some real floating point here. And let's say 1.01 .01 plus 1.01. .01. So we know that 1.01 .01 plus 1.01 .01 will not equal 2.0. So I'm anticipating that this test will fail. And the test fails. Now let's bump our delta uh, from 0, 0. Let's make it 0, 3, give ourselves a little bit of wiggle room here and run one more time. And there we go, run unit test. And you see that it passes now because we've given a delta that says, okay, these two numbers, 2.0, and the result of i, which is 1.01 plus 1.01, .01, they just need to be within 0 0.03 of each other. Again, that's only available on our floating point types of double and float. So that's a high level look at the JUnit asserts that we can use in a test and also the annotations that we can use in a test. Naturally, right now, we just kind of dummied some things up, so we're not really testing a whole lot. But nonetheless, you now have a good idea of the building blocks that you can use uh, to build these unit tests. And what's important is that a lot of these concepts are not just used in unit tests, but a lot of them are used in other kinds of tests as well, like integration tests and UI tests. So even if it's not a true unit test, the things that you've seen here, you can use in either format. So, I uh, hope this was helpful, and I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you.